Well, I just want to say to you this morning how grateful I am that each of you are here today. I, I hope that you've come today to worship. I hope you've come today to hear. And I hope that you come to obey. Whatever it is that God wants to do, whatever he wants to say, that you would just trust him completely. And that's not always easy, I know. But when we are faithful to him, it is amazing what God can do. We are talking about your big mouth today, by the way, and my big mouth today, so that I don't offend anybody. We're all in the same boat together. And it is amazing to me, is it not, to you, how our mouths can get us in such trouble. Unintentionally, it gets us in trouble. There are ways that we respond. There are moods that we get into. There are things that we do and say that we don't even see it until it's too late. In fact, sometimes we just take advantage of moments and we don't realize until somebody says something or the Holy Spirit convicts us that we realize, man, what was I thinking? What happened when I said that? Or why did I treat that person that way? And why did I use my words to hurt in such a harmful way? I have to tell you a story as we get started today. I remember when um, many, many years ago now when I became senior pastor here at New Paris, uh, we had this grand idea at Easter time, that we would have a special music group come in. They would be the focal point, uh, their ministry would be the focal point of that service as we honored God on Resurrection Day. We, we just thought that that would be an exciting time. And we had looked into some groups that we thought that we might look at and see if they, we could schedule them to come, and we, we got the group that we wanted. We, we had listened to them at a, a, a revival type of setting where many, many groups were there. And we said, man, we just, they, they have just a beautiful, beautiful message. Their, their voices just ring up to heaven. And that was the picture that I had in my mind when we thought about having them come. And so we remember scheduling them, and we knew what time they were going to be here on a Saturday evening. And myself and my associate pastor, Jeff Seaver, said, we will meet you here at the church we will have everything set up for you at the hotel, and we will have people here ready to help you unload when you get here. That's exactly what happened. They pulled up. Uh, it was about an hour and a half later than what they thought. They got into some traffic and stuff, so that put them behind. And we greeted them at the door. And I remember the words that they spoke as soon as we opened the doors. In fact, it was, it was kind of a, a, a bad weekend. The weather was kind of crummy. And Jeff and I had just been out shoveling. And so we looked like we had been out shoveling too. And we met them at the door. And they, we said, hi, we're here to help you unload. And they said, well, get to it. And thought, okay, we'll get to it. And we were unloading stuff. We were bringing it in. And we said, where would you like this? You know, because we weren't sure where everything was going to go because they were bringing all of their equipment. And they said, put it down there. And, then, you know, and I, I was beginning at this point, you know, there's this little this thought that was going through my mind. Appreciation was going through my mind. And how I am so glad that it's me that's here and not one of my parishioners or one of my trustees that was hearing this. I didn't say anything and not... Not to say that I wasn't feeling something, but I was, I, was, I was thinking, you know, maybe they just have had a really bad day getting here, and the weather's been crummy, and so let's give them the benefit of the doubt. And so as we continued to unload, there were more remarks that were made, one right after another, and quite honestly, I was just about this close to saying, hey, I think you should just pack your stuff up and go. That was kind of the way I felt, to be quite honest. In my mind, that's what's going through my mind. And at the very end, when everything got brought in and everything got upset, they came up to me and they said, hey, we would like to be introduced to your pastor. And I said, well, I am he, and that's my associate pastor. Immediately, there was this switch that got turned on. It went from feeling very, very unappreciated until there was a whole lot of, I call blowing some smoke, and, and I was upset and in that moment, I realized that God was saying to me, Dave, be quick to listen, be slow to speak, be slow to anger, and love them. And I have to say, it wasn't the best weekend. It, it didn't turn out the way I hoped that it would. But I am so grateful that I listened to the Lord and I did not let what was going on in my mind come out of my mouth. And the question I have for you this morning is how many times, including myself, has that very thing that has been going on in your mind 
come out so quickly through your mouth. And it happens to all of us. In fact, we all make mistakes with our tongues. We all do. A couple weeks ago, I gave you a rubber band. I don't know if you remember that or not, but I handed out a rubber band to every single one of us. And I said to you, it's just a challenge. I want you to put this rubber band on your wrist, and I want you to keep it there. And in those moments when you gripe and complain and argue, switch it over to your left hand and let it be a reminder that you need to deal with that issue. And then you put it right back to your right hand. Now, I don't know about you, but I started getting little marks on my hand where that rubber band was so tight around my wrist and then it began to decay and, and, and fall apart. And so I have a little challenge for you. In about two weeks, when we are finished with this series, I'm going to be handing out a little bracelet for you. And I'm going to ask that you wear it for 21 days. And allow God to speak to you about listening and about being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Do it for 21 days. Because you know why 21 days? Because at 21 days, it becomes a pattern. And I got to tell you, for that one week that I wore that rubber band, my life was changed forever. I got like three brand new Facebook friends. I, got a, I think I got a refund that came in the mail. My wife just thinks I'm the bomb. I mean, I don't even know where that came from. My life was changed. And let me say to you this morning, so can yours. Now, I didn't get a refund. My wife may not think that I'm the bomb. But here's the thing. And I got no Facebook friends, by the way. But here's the thing. I want you to know this morning that when we control that tongue, it changes our life forever. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We often see it in other people, though, don't we? Can I just say that up front before we begin right now? It is so easy for us to see the ugly in other people and we don't see it in ourselves. Oh, they shouldn't have said that. They shouldn't have acted like that. And we don't ever see that come from us. It is almost like, hey, you know what? I see that speck in your eye, but I don't know how because I got this plank in my eye. You know, it's one of those kinds of things. And so this morning, I want us to talk about that together. This message is not for that person that you're sitting next to, okay, just so that you're clear. Uh, so no nudging this morning to say, hey, this message is for you, or oh, how I wish that this person was here today, because this message is for all of us. So I'd like to ask that you just do me a favor. Everybody raise your right hand. Would you just do that this morning? And would you just repeat after me, this sermon is for me. Not for my neighbor. Okay, so we all are in agreement. Here's what we're going to see today. Here's what we're going to talk about today. Matthew chapter 12, verse 37, it tells us this. And, and by the way, when you read this verse, and you're seeing it already, you're going to see it just a moment. When you read this verse, what's incredible about this verse is that when you just read it, it sounds like, man, he was really building that thing up. I mean, he was making that out to be something much bigger than it really is. When you hear the words, it sounds like that. But he doesn't. He is being very true to the power of your tongue. And this is what he says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 37. It says this. For by your words, you will be acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned. Can I just ask you to write or circle these two words? Acquitted and condemned. He says that by your words, by those words, you have the power to be acquitted or you have the power to be condemned. Now, that's just your tongue. Can you imagine? He is putting that kind of emphasis on the power of my tongue and your tongue. It is the difference between life and death. In fact, Proverbs 18.21, it almost echoes this very same thing that Matthew gives us. He says this in Proverbs 18.21, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So the words that come out of your mouth and out of my mouth will either justify us or it'll condemn us. One of the two. It has that kind of great power. That is why we take this series so serious. Because what we do with that very little thing that you have in your mouth is the difference between life and death, justification or condemnation. It has that kind of power. So 
Here's just a couple things that your words do, just so that as we get started today, just to give you an idea of the power behind these kinds of words. Here's the first. And by the way, if you have your notes this morning, would you just get them out and just write these things down? I think they'll be a, a blessing to you as you begin to ponder this more in your own time. And here's the first thing that you can know about your words. Our words determine our relationships. Your words determine our relationships. By your tongue, you can determine the general health of your relationships with other people. By your tongue, you can tell. In fact, I don't know. Some of you are going to be in my age category and older, and so you will remember this. Do you remember when you would go to the doctor, and they would take a popsicle stick, and they would stick it in your mouth and hold your tongue down? It would be one of the first things that they would do. They would examine the inside of your mouth. And in a sense, not completely, but in a sense, they could determine the general physical health of you just by examining the inside of your mouth. That is what the writer, uh, uh, the, uh, that's what Matthew's talking about. That's what the psalmist and, and, and is talking about. That's what Proverbs is speaking about. That it has the power of life and death, condemnation and justification. And on top of that, it also, in a sense, has the power of health when it comes to your relationships. In what way? Here's just a few to think about. It, it gives you the de determination of the relationship of your marriage, of your friendships, of your family, of your future, of your commitments. By the words that you speak, by the words that I speak, it has the power to determine those relationships. And we'll get to that in just a minute. So let me just read to you first such a, an incredible statement that James gives us about a spark. On your grill, if you have an electric grill, you may have one of those push-button sparks that just start to, hit, to start your flame. I want you to think about that. You probably have seen it. It's hard to even almost see it because it's just such a small thing. But this is the way that James describes that small little spark. He says this in James 3, 5 through 8. He says, likewise, he says, the tongue is a small part of the body, just so small, but it makes great boast. And then he tells you about this picture of it. He says, consider what a great forest is set, is set on fire by a small spark. So imagine these great, big, huge forests, and all it takes is this one little spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body, he says. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life, he says. Here it is, those determining the relationship. It sets the course for that. The course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell, he says. But look at the rest of it. He says all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. These things can be controlled, he says. But look at what he says about this. He says, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is restless evil, full of deadly poison. The word says that no human being can tame the tongue. But I'm going to suggest to you this morning that we may not be able to tame the tongue, but the tongue can be controlled. And in what way? And can I just ask you, just so that we're all on the same page, how many of you have ever seen the course of your life in one thing or another, whether it be a relationship, your job, your future, your, your, your children, that one small spark of words change the outcome of those relationships. I would dare to say that if it hasn't happened to you, you know of a situation so dear and so close to you where you have seen just words alone that have been so destructive when it comes to relationships. And then it takes time to put it all out, to, 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 to put that fire out that has been sparked by just the words that come from your mouth for relationships to grow back. So not only does it affect the relationships, but here's the second thing that it does. It determines our maturity. <laughs> it says something about your maturity and mine. 
In fact, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, it says this. He says, don't let anyone look down on you because of your, that you're young, but set an example for the believers. And here's what he says and how we should do it. He says, do it, believers, in speech. Oh, circle that because that's what we're talking about. Your mouth, my mouth. In speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. So just imagine this. He puts speech in the very same category as love, faith, and purity. <laughs> he says that's how big a deal it is for you to have a, a control to understand how important it is that your mouth can either be destructive or it can bring wholeness. It can bring wholeness or it can bring pain. It can bring life or it can bring death. It can bring justification or it can bring condemnation. It has that kind of power and he puts it in the same category as faith and love and purity. And I have seen it in action. I have seen the destructiveness of that kind of mentality. And I was thinking, what was one of the best illustrations I could ever give you? In fact, I'm just going to tell you for the record. Is Coral, are you here today? Who are you? Is Coral here? Okay. She was way too tired probably from last night's trip then. No. Oh, she's downstairs. So she don't know about this. So don't tell her that we were talking about that this morning, okay? Would you just kind of keep that between us today? We were talking yesterday, you know, we were in Chicago for our trip that we took as a church, and we went to the zoo and to the Navy Pier, and, and there are tons and tons of people there that were all over, and, and Coral came up to me, and she said, now, Pastor, you remember you talked about how you like to stalk and to gawk a lot? And I said, yeah. She goes, she goes, I bet Chicago, man, just does all that for you and more. I said, I was on overload. There were just so many people around. And, and I thought about what she had said because the story that I want to share with you this morning is because of that stalking and gawking, okay? So just so you know. And it's not in a bad way for visitors today. I'm not going to do that to you just so you know. But um, I was at a hotel one time, and uh, my wife asked me to go downstairs and check on something while she was uh, unpacking her clothes. And I was kind of standing to the side, and there was this lady, oh, probably about 60 years old or so, and she's standing at the, uh, at, at the check-in area there, and she's talking about this room that she had requested, a specific room number. And if I remember right, it was like room 148 or something like that. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was something like that. And she said, I had requested room 148, and I don't have it, and I want that room. And she goes, ma'am, I'm sorry, but that room has been taken. But I can give you a room just like it, and maybe I can even give you an upgrade. She goes, no, I don't want the upgrade. I asked for that room. You don't understand. This is important to me. She goes, ma'am, I am so sorry, but I'm going to do everything I can do to accommodate you. And I'm thinking, wow, this lady is really being very generous to this woman. And she goes on and she goes, you don't understand something. She goes, I'm having a breakdown here. <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, talking about getting a little far-fetched. I mean, you're a little too excited, lady. That's what I'm thinking. And she, the, the, the young lady that was at the counter said, ma'am, do you need help? Do you need me to call 911? And she wasn't being sarcastic. I mean, she was being as friendly and as kind as you could be. She goes, no, I don't need any help. I need 148. That's what I need. And she goes, you know, are you even listening to me? Do you even understand what words are coming out of my mouth? I mean, you're Hispanic, right? So you don't know what's coming out of my mouth. You don't know what I'm saying, do you? And she goes, ma'am, I am Hispanic, but I understand every word that you're saying, and I'm trying to help you. And I'm standing over here to the side, and I'm listening to that conversation. I'm thinking, man, that lady behind that desk, she needs a trophy. And I'm not talking about a participation trophy. I'm talking first place trophy. That woman has taken everything, and she has responded in love over and over and over again. And I kept thinking to myself, this lady is 60 years old. And Timothy tells us, hey, your age, when it comes to your age and how you act, you can control that thing, and you're young. So what do you say to somebody who's 60 years old and they're still fighting this issue of being able to control that little thing that is between their lips? How sad. And Timothy, Paul talks about this in Timothy. He says, man, you got to get this thing under control. Now, I know what some of you are saying right now, but pastor... You know what? Sometimes I get a little irate. I'll be the first one to raise my hand and say it. It happens to me sometimes, and I get that. 
And you know that the word says that you can't tame the tongue, but can I control it, Pastor? Is there some way that I can control it? And the answer to that is absolutely you can. And here's how, just so we're clear. These are the three things that that will help us to tame, or I should say control, that little fire plug between your lips. Here's the first. And this is going to sound very simplistic, and I understand. But the first is this. It's called silence. Write that down. The first thing that we need to do if we're going to control the tongue, it is silence. I mean zip it. I mean, I'm not saying go out, give somebody the silent treatment. I'm not saying that. I'm saying to listen, to be quiet first and listen. It means to do something that we are not accustomed to. It means that before we begin to speak, stop and think about what you're saying. Is room 148 really all that important that you would get to the point that you would get that irate? If that person who just pulled out in front of you, that you would think that they purposely did that, or do you think that maybe they just weren't watching and maybe it happens to you also? Whatever it is that happens, stop and be silent. In fact, let me just tell you, James 1.19 says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be what? Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So when you start talking, and with words that start flowing, and and man, sometimes without even thinking about how you say those things, then there comes this anger that flows out of our mouth, and we don't intentionally do it, but it just happens that way, right? So instead, take a walk and think about it. Think about what it is that you need to say. Go ahead and start typing out that email that you want to send to that person if you want. But you know what? Once you've typed it out, sleep on it overnight before you hit the uh, send button. Do what you need to do first. Stop and just be silent and ask yourself, is this really what I want to say? Oh, there's so much more to this than just that, though. So uh, you, You think, wait a minute, Pastor, time out now. There's a few things that I have a problem with about what you're saying about telling me to be silent. Because first of all, I mean, I live in America, and you're talking about my freedom of speech. Okay, so I'm being very polite about this, but let me tell you, this is what is told to us from God's word in Psalm 39, verse 1. And if you think that I'm being too harsh, listen to what he says. He says, I said, I will watch my ways, he says, and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth while in the presence of the wicked. (laughs) I will do whatever it takes to make sure that before I speak, uh, I'll be silent. Be still and know that he is God. And let him do the work that we so desperately try to do on our own. Be still and know that he can do what he needs to do. And you don't have to fix it yourself. I'm not saying to be passive, and I'm not saying never to say anything. What I am saying to you this morning is to think before you speak. I love weddings. Can I just tell you? Oh, I, oh, how I enjoy them. Just did one two weeks ago. So glad the couple came home. We're glad for them to be back with us. Mr. and Mrs. Leopard, by the way, congratulations to you guys. Yeah, you can do that. I was asked to do a wedding for a friend of mine that I worked with uh, a number, number of years ago. And because of conflicts with schedules in, in the counseling sessions, I wasn't able to do it. So they found another pastor to do their wedding. And so I was able to go to the wedding, but that was the only date that I was available. And so, so I came to the wedding with my wife, and she's sitting there with me. She doesn't know the couple at all, but I worked with him. And um, he, they had this idea of a theme. They were going to do the Star Wars theme, you know. It was going to be like Luke and Princess Leia kind of thing. And I, that's not my gig. I don't do that kind of stuff. So, so we, I just went to the wedding. Though they didn't do it anyway, so it kind of... It got blown up, but anyway. Um, so there, okay, that's a little funny. Never mind, go, go into the story. Anyway, so back to the story. Anyway, so I'm listening to the couple as they're standing up there with the pastor, and the pastor's, you know, introducing everybody, and he's talking about the couple that stands before them. And, and, and I noticed that when he mentioned the couple's names, it wasn't the name of the lady that was standing up there with him. I thought, wait a minute. And I took a better look at that. Is that the same lady that he introduced me to when he said he was getting married, right? Yeah, it sure was. The pastor goes on further in the message, mentions the names again. Same name to the same girl. Now, I'm looking at that girl, 
And I'm watching the expression on her face. When she was standing there with her father, there was a smile on her face. But as time began to go a little further, that smile changed. It was, up, it was, up, it was like this, and then it went like this. And now I'm seeing a whole new look on her face. She's quiet. She's not saying, she is very, very just still. At the very end of the message, you know what happens. The pronouncement. You know, now therefore by the authority conferred upon me by the laws of the state of India. You know that part. He speaks her name one more time. And finally she looks up. After a long, almost a 45 minute uh, ser- service. And she finally looks up and she says, sir, my name is not Julie. Julie is the name of his previous wife. And I said to myself, wow. That woman was quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anchor. And can I say to you this morning, a lot of us would have never gone that far. But oh, how desperately we need to stop and listen before we speak. Almost impossible to imagine. So the first thing is this. We need to listen. We need to be still. The second thing is this, and this is something that is very important. The second is this. We need to find a lightning rod. Can I just talk to you about a lightning rod this morning? In our part of the country, they're very, very common. In other parts of the country, they're not common at all. For those of you who are a whole lot smarter in these things than when I am, I remember the first time I saw one up on the top of a barn or on top of a house, I thought, you know what, they must have cable or something, you know, up there. That's what I was thinking. And I thought, no, no, there's something more to it than that. You know, if, without those lightning rods, if lightning were to hit the building, it could short out the wiring, it could start a fire, it could cause major damage out of just that one, you know, spark of lightning. And, you know, it could easily happen. But it's to catch that light, it's to become a lightning rod to ground it. And so I was sitting there and I was thinking to myself, you know, don't you wish you had somebody like that in your life? Don't you wish you had a lightning rod, that person that you can go to? That person who in the midst of your trouble, when it is hard, and you say, but pastor, I can't just be silent completely. i got to talk about it. Well, good. Then find a person who can be a lightning rod in your life. That person who when you are having trouble, you can go to them and you can speak to them. And let me talk about some criteria this morning. When it comes to finding that right kind of person. When you're looking for that person, and I hope that you find somebody like this. Let me first say this. There's two things that you need to know about that person before you choose to talk to them. They need to love Jesus and they need to love you. And let me say this again. Love Jesus and love you in that order. That is crucial. I'm grateful that they love you, but first and foremost, they need to love Jesus first. You know why? Because they need to be the kind of people who can speak truth into your life and not just feel like I can never hurt because I love them so very much. You say the truth in love because you love Jesus first. It's important. In fact, here's here's, here's something else you need to know. For me, I used to struggle with this. When I first went into ministry, I thought, oh, you know, there was this times that people said something and man, it really hurt. What do I do? So I'd go to my mentor, I'd go to John Moran, who was my pastor, many of you remember him. And I remember thinking, John, I gotta talk to you. And then he retired and he left here, right? So then I'm here by myself and I've got other issues and I'm talk- this person said this or this happened at a district meeting and I don't know what to do about it and I just need to say something. And I'd call John up and I'd say, John, man, I got this problem and I think something needs to be said. Can I come over and talk to you about it? He goes, come over right now. And he, he, he and Rita would always make sure that when Elaine and I got there, there would always be a bowl of ice cream. Every time we went over, before we even talked about the problem, there would be a bowl of ice cream. Bowl of ice cream and a Diet Coke. And you know, there was just something about the bowl of ice cream that just slowed down my anger to the point where I could actually listen to the advice that he was about to share. And he knew how important ice cream would be. And let me say to you, that when you find that, that lightning rod in your life, here's what they will do. They will not just take what you say and be angry at you and no longer want to be around you. They will want to influence you. And they also will be the type of people that when, when you say something about something that's happened in your life, that they don't become a, a spark either. 
Do you know how that sometimes happens? You ever have somebody who tells you something and say, you know, that person, this is what they said to me. Can you believe that? And then the person you just told says, I can't believe that either. Man, I hate that guy too. You know, that kind of stuff. You don't want a lightning rod who becomes a fire themselves. You need that person who's going to think through those things and, and, and bring us all or bring you to the throne of God. Not to a place of more difficulty and more anger. See, John was never about saying, hey, Dave, you're absolutely right. Give it to him. Tell him what you think. No, he says, you know what? Let's go to the throne room of God and let's seek his face. Let me tell you, you know how many times over and over again that experience made that situation so much better. And the ice cream didn't hurt either. By the way, here's the, here's the thing you need to know too. Proverbs 18, 24 tells us this. One who has rely, unreliable friends, those people who who are going to become angry at you, those people who are going to become just like you, this is what happens. He says, one who has unreliable friends soon uh, comes to ruin, he says. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. It is those people who are a lightning rod in your life. And I'm just going to challenge you. Oh, I pray that you will seek out a person like that in your life. And I'm not saying it has to be your spouse. Although I think you should share stuff with your spouse. But I think there are times that you need a person who you know that you can go to and they're going to listen and they're going to bring truth into your life. They're going to seek God's face before they speak. You have given them permission to be that to you. Not a person who holds a grudge, not any of that stuff, but a person who becomes a lightning rod into your life. What's that, buddy? And that's true too. You betcha. You betcha. Can you confide in them? You betcha. So you need to be silent. You need to find a lightning rod. And here's the third. And most of the time this happens because you, you and I become angry at people. And we respond the way that we do. And most of the time it is for this reason right here. Because we don't do this. The third thing you must do is you'll need to learn to cry out to God in prayer. The reason why we often take it out on people, folks, is because we don't cry out to God, because we don't seek him. When we cry out to God, can I just tell you this morning, there is something about what happens when you and I cry out to him. It, 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 it's almost like it, it causes an adjustment to occur in our hearts. There's something about when you and I cry, and I'm not talking about crying out to God and, and grumbling to God or getting mad at God. It comes to that point when there is this surrender that happens. When we surrender to him and we cry out to God and we say, God, in my strength, I can't do it. But, oh, Father, I'm in pain and I'm struggling and I need you. The most important thing we could ever do is cry out to God. Because here's what you need to know. Two things I want you to write down. The first is this, is that God will not begin as long as you refuse to end. God will not begin as long as you refuse to end. When you don't get to that point where you say, God, I can't, but you can, he, you're never giving him the permission to do a work in your life. Scripture says that when I am weak, he is what? Yeah. God has had to say to me many, many times, I want to help. I want to do what you're, you're asking. But you got to get to the point where you surrender it so that I can truly do it. Because when you are weak, I am strong. When you're fighting the battle, you're not allowing me to fight it. I never understood that. In fact, so many times I knew what I was feeling, but I didn't know how to say it. And I heard this a while back, and I was sharing with our huddle group just the other night. And I said, I came across this, this statement, and man, it's not my own, but man, I am trusting in this. And I don't think that this is in your notes, but I would pray that you'd write this down because it captured my heart too. I, it, it was almost like, and, and these I think are the words that he was really saying to me. I can't be strong in your life. I can't be strong in your life as, as long as you refuse to be weak. Because unless you, re, you choose to be weak, I can never be strong in your life. And as long as you refuse it, as long as you keep putting the hands up and you do it, or you're looking for him or her to do it for you, 
I can never be strong until you refuse to be weak. But when you choose to be weak, then I'm made strong. And then I'm able to do what only I can. It's when we get to the end of our rope that God says, that's where I can do my best work. Can I just tell you, the men of old cried out to God. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not a sign that you and I aren't able or that it's the wrong thing to do. Because let me tell you, David cried out to God all the time. Seek my heart, O God, he said. And search me and see if there be anything in me. Gideon cried out to God. Abraham cried out to God. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane cried out to God. Father, if there be any other way for this to be taken away from me, let it be, but not my will be done, but yours. Psalm 107 verse 6 tells us, Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Deliverance comes when we cry out. The other psalm, Psalm 107, which is just a little further on, in verse 19, almost mimics that verse in verse 6, but it says this. Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. So he delivered them, and he saved them from their distress. Hmm. I've got to tell you real quick a, a story from my life, and it's a story that you've heard many times, I'm sure, but I want to share it anyway because... It is that place where I found Christ, and it was that place where I realized that, man, when I allow him to be all that he is, he can do great things, but I have to allow him to be that. There are two situations in my life that I go back to over and over again, and I was just sharing some of that with some people this morning before Sunday school class, and you've heard me say this before, but I don't think I've gone to this extent. I became so bitter at God in my life because of what had happened. My, my situation at home was very bad growing up. And my grandmother, who was the foundation of our, our family, who I lived with her, uh, got cancer. And two months later, she was gone. And, and, and my dad, who was an alcoholic at the time, and praise be to God, he knows Jesus today. I'm so grateful for that. But in that moment, in that time, it was a rough life. And I, and I was so angry at God, I could not understand why, why all this had to happen this way. And, and never did I become weak and let him be strong. I was trying to fight the battle for myself. And, and, and in those moments, in those days, and I felt like what I just described. I, he could never be strong in my life until I refuse to be strong and be weak for him. And I remember knowing how that felt. My pastor, his name was D. Law Schaefer, every year for four years in a row, every Saturday, we would golf. And every time we golfed, he paid for it every time. And he never brought Jesus up, not even once. It was almost like he was as patient as Job. And I remember it was just that one day on a course, it was when I became broken. It wasn't because of something he said. I was just so angry and I was so I was filled of such hurt, I didn't know what to do. And right there, as we're golfing, I start crying. And I said, I, I don't even want to be here. And he says, what's wrong? And I said, I'm just so frustrated. And he looked me right in the eye and he said, you know what? When you become weak, it's when he becomes strong. And it was right there in that moment that he prayed with me. Four years went by. Four long years that he waited patiently for me to become broken. And then we gave our heart, I gave my heart to Jesus. And, and a few years went by and, and I found myself doing things that, that weren't lining up with where God wanted me to be. And I found the love of my life. And for six long years, my wife and I dated. And then, then we got married. And the first year of our marriage was rough. And it was really hard. And can I tell you that there I was again. I was fighting. I was trying to win the victory with my own strength. I was going to fix her and she was going to fix me. And all that stuff was happening simultaneously. And we both came to that point. Same day, same, same afternoon. <laughs> my wife got down on her knees. And she said, I don't have the power. But Lord, you have the power to change me. And I got down on my knees and I prayed the exact same prayer. And I said, God, I don't have the power either. But you can change both of us. And I felt so unsure in that moment. Can I just tell you, I was so unsure. 
Because that meant that at this moment, I am not going to do anything to work on her, and she's not doing anything to work on me. We're just going to let God work on us together. And can I just tell you that something changed that day? Was every day after that absolutely perfect? No. But every year was a better year. I fell in love with her more and more every day. And you know, it wasn't just about her. It was about a love that God was putting in my heart that wasn't what I could make on my own. It was his love. It was his patience and his kindness. It was his generosity. And it became a part of her too. And there's days that I sit in my office and I look at this picture that I have in my office of our 25-year reunion, that, that, I'm sorry, at wedding renewal. And I got to tell you, just in case you don't know, you got to go back to Northwood's uh, yearbook. 1989 is the year to look up. I didn't look like this. <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> I got bigger. <laughs> and it, if my wife was here, she'd probably tell you she got bigger too. But I am so more in love with her today than I have ever been before. And I tell people that all the time, and I want you to know why, because that's my story. It's a story of a man who knew his marriage was not going to last. And I had nothing, I could do nothing to fix it. And then God showed up and he said, hey, you want my strength? Then you just say yes and say no to you. And now let me do what only I can do. And you know what? I'm so grateful because life is so much different today. And it's not about a marriage either. It is about him. And it always has been about him. You see, that's what it always goes back to again and again and again. Everything that we have, everything that, that changes our lives is because of what Jesus did, what, what he did on the cross, what he did for you and for me. He opened a door for the Holy Spirit to come and live in us and change us and take away my selfishness and my bitterness and my anger and all that stuff and say, hey, you may not be able to tame that tongue, but you can control it. And with my help, you can have a great life in me. Because it's not about you anymore. It's about him. It's about you're no longer yourself. You're, you're his. And I just want you to know this morning that I could ramble on for another 15 or 20 minutes about that. But I will say to you this. The power of Jesus Christ is real. And it can be real in you too. And some of what stops that from happening is that stinking little thing in your mouth that we just can't get a hold of on our own. No human man can tame the tongue, but he can do great things. So I'm going to ask you to stand this morning. And I know that we're running a little behind in time, but this is his time. And this is for him and for you and for me. And so this morning, we're going to sing together. And maybe you're here this morning like everybody in the room that has a trouble with their mouth. And maybe you're here today and you say, you know what? Maybe for the first time, I realize I have never cried out. That I've never put myself at that place where I said, oh, yeah, for you to become strong, I have to refuse to be weak. And maybe you just want to choose to be weak today. You maybe came from a background where you were taught that weakness is bad. Let me say to you this morning, weakness is the only thing that changes a life. Where you get rid of what you think you can do on your own and allow God to do what only he can do. And when you come to that point, let me tell you, regardless of what other people around you think about that, your life can be better. And so maybe this morning you just want to lay that right here and put it before him. Maybe you need to ask for him to help you to be silent. Maybe you need that person in your life who truly will listen and be that lightning rod. I don't know what you need today, but he does. And your life will be different. I promise you that. So the altars are open if you want to pray. But let's sing together and then we'll close our time in prayer, okay? Let's sing. I never cry except when I'm here with you guys. I don't know why that is. Yeah, I'm lying. I'm sorry, Newman. Um, 
But can I just tell you that isn't it amazing when you've been here and you find yourself on the other side how much joy there is in knowing that you don't have to be like that anymore. It, whether it be in your marriage or in friendships, relationships with your children, whatever it may be, there's just something about seeing it and knowing it and knowing that your life is different and it has nothing to do with you. It is that reassurance that, that our Lord Jesus Christ is on the throne and he knows what you need. And he is capable, more than capable, to give you exactly that. So with every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, in the moments that we have remaining, I'd like to ask if there might be someone who is here today that would say, Pastor, I know that feeling, and I have worked so hard, and I have put on the gloves, and I have fought as hard as I can fight, and it has done nothing. It has done nothing to make this thing better. And maybe it's time that I take the gloves off. And maybe it's time that, that you start thinking about him and his power and a whole lot less about you. And maybe that needs to be your prayer today. And if it is, and you say, Pastor, would you pray that, that I would have the, the courage not to continue to fight, but to find the courage to become weak so that he can be strong. That I would say yes so that he could become the power behind my life. If that's you this morning, you say, Pastor, would you just pray for me as this, this journey begins for me? And if that's you, all I'm going to ask you to do is to raise your hand up and put it right back down and I'll pray for you. I see your hand. I see it. Yep. I see that hand. I see it. Yep. I see your hand. Yep, I see it, buddy. God, you're faithful. Beyond what we can give each other, the love that we have for each other, no matter how much there is of that, Lord, nothing, nothing compares to you. Nothing compares to your power and nothing compares to your yes. <laughs> and so, Father, this morning, that's what I pray for. I pray for my brothers and I pray for my sisters. And I pray, Lord, that you would just give them that courage that they need. Father, help them to move beyond what they are capable of on their own. And may they rest in your arms. May they rest in your strength and in your power. And Lord, would you just show them what the other side can be. And oh, Father... <laughs> What a day of rejoicing that will be when they experience that. And so, Father, we commend it to you and to you alone. And, Lord, we ask that you do what only you can. And we will watch and we will trust and we will obey whatever it is that you need to do. And it's in your precious name I pray. And all God's people said... Amen, and God bless you. I pray you have a wonderful day in the Lord today.